I'll just introduce, yeah, okay. Cool. Yeah, so Miss, I'll just introduce you really quickly and then you can talk when I hand over to you. No problem. You want me to put video on that? Yeah, you can. It's fine. So, like, as in some people are like, you don't have to put your video on, some people are like, it makes it more personable. So, it's whatever, really. Right. So, I'll just let a few more people join and then we can start. Yeah. We've got 18 people, including the two of us. Right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this tutorial. So today's tutorial is on clinical cases in paediatrics cardiology given by Dr. Dea. Um, just a few rules. For those of you that are watching via Zoom, any questions or comments for things that are covered in the moment, if you could just pop it into the chat. Any questions that can wait to the end, if you just put it into the Q&A. And if you're watching on the Facebook Live, just comment your questions or comments and we'll pass them on to the tutor. So that's all from me and I'll hand over to Dr. Dea. Thank you. Hey, hi guys, um, I'm Dea, I'm in FYT uh, and I currently work in respiratory and general adult medicine, that is in general general medicine in Kettering. Uh, so thank you for giving up a little part of your Friday evening to join in. Um, as most of you who have either gone through your like specialties year or are about to like within paediatrics cardiology is kind of it's quite a specialist subject so I'm just going to try and hone in on some key points um, and so thank you for to becoming a doctor for letting me host so these are just some of them so I think the main things are appreciating what the fetal circulation is like what happens at birth and then what goes on to happen in the adult circulation and then I think the key one of the key things that I want to focus on is differentiating between cyanotic and acyanotic heart disease. Um, so I think it's just understanding that and then being aware of some genetic conditions and infection associated with congenital heart disease or somehow the disease has gone off from the end of that learning objective. Apologies. Um, which is kind of by rote learning. So you either, you just kind of learn about it. So we're going to move on. Um, right. So this is a nice picture of the fetal circulation. So as you will all, I'm sure, know that the placenta supplies pretty much all the oxygen to the fetus, not the lungs. So the lungs are like tiny buds, really. They don't, they're really irrelevant. So the right, uh, the right ventricle and left ventricle sort of contribute to pumping to the, um, to all of the body uh, because um, it just bypasses the lungs. So uh, the, ductus arteriosus it shunts the blood so that it doesn't go to the lung and then it goes into the systemic circulation so that bypasses the lung so transitional circulation so why why is everyone obsessed with that crying because that's when the baby's lungs are expanding and so that's so with the first few breaths of a neonate um and that cry the lungs expand so with preemie babies, you know, their lungs are underdeveloped, um, obviously, which is why they give a number of different like respiratory stimulants like caffeine and things to help the baby breathe while the lungs are still expanding. Placenta is obviously taken away and lungs take over as the oxygenator of the blood. And then the foramen ovale closes. So you remember that the foramen ovale is in between the uh, two atria, between the right and left atria, which allows for some mixing of blood. And then, but once this foramen ovale closes, it means that there's no blood flowing from the right atrium into the left atrium. And so blood goes from the like SVC, IVC, so all the venous bits into the right atrium, right ventricle, uh, pulmonary artery into the lungs to be oxygenated. So like in an adult, essentially. And the ductus arteriosus, which is between the pulmonary artery and the aorta, closes over the first one to three days. And it becomes an adult's... Um, an arterial landmark, uh, a bit, an anatomical landmark called ligamentum arteriosum. This is just, this is just, um, I quite like things, looking at things pictorially. So you can see the foramen ovale um, here between the two atria. 
and it closes and so it, the area it leaves is called the fossa ovalis because it's like a little groove and this makes sure that there's no mixing of the deoxygenated and oxygenated blood and then here you can see the ductus arteriosus between the pulmonary artery and the aorta so that also uh, closes and so the blood that goes out of the right ventricle is forced to go through the pulmonary artery to the lungs and it doesn't go into the aorta. Okay, and then ductus venosus, it, by, uh, it bypasses the liver, so the um, inferior vena cava then carries up the deoxygenated blood back to the heart. Okay. Um, but for most of the like, congenital cardiac disease, it will be looking at things that go wrong in the heart, within the heart and stuff, so things like the foramen ovale or the, um, or the ductus arteriosus, and we'll move on to some other things. So, in the neonatal circulation, so you know that Obviously, the right ventricle is the lungs and left ventricle is the systemic circulation. So obviously, in, in like that newborn and like just before they're born, the pulmonary vascular resistance is really high. And so the, so the pressures that the right ventricle and left ventricle are pumping against are about the same. But as the lungs expand, the pulmonary vascular resistance decreases and therefore the right ventricular pressure starts to fall because it's pumping against less resistance. And so in the first uh, four to six weeks of life, the right ventricular pressure falls and the left ventricle becomes the dominant one because obviously it's um, pumping against a much higher, um, much higher pressure than the right ventricle and it becomes dominant. And that's obviously what it's like in adults. So the left ventricular pressure ends up being about five times higher than the right ventricular pressure. So, um, so I don't know if you guys know this, so a, a quick way sort of to remember the rough pressures of each chamber of the heart. It's like, it's like a rule of, um, it's like a square rule. So like if the, so you can imagine the pressure in the right atrium is quite low. So if we take that to be about five, then the pressure in the right ventricle is the square of that. So it's 25 roughly. And then you've got, um, the left atrium is about double that of the right atrium, so it's 10, and then square of that in the left ventricle becomes 100. So 25 and 100, so that's about four times as much. And that sort of, tolerance, so we say that a normal healthy person's blood pressure, like a young person's, is like 120 by 80 is that big. So, you know, 100 to 120 is quite normal for a young person. So think of that. So that's in a normal adult, but obviously in a neonate, you've got lots of pulmonary vascular resistance, so the right ventricle is more dominant than it is in an adult. So if in the chat you want to put some, the, the names of some cyanotic congenital cardiac conditions, um, I'll give you a minute or so to come up with some. Toff, good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. ASD, yeah. So, so, yeah. so um, some people have put, I can't see other people's comments, but uh, some people have put it to all panellists, so it needs to be to all panellists and attendees, otherwise not everyone will be able to see it. Well, that's not a problem. Yeah, good. Okay, I think most of you know, so... Is that okay? Very good. Um, I'm not going to focus on literally all the cardiac conditions because we'll be here for ages. I just want to go through some of the ones that are probably more common uh, and that tend to come up a little bit more in exams than others. Um, if you want more in-depth ones on the ones I don't cover, feel free to read it up or speak to a pediatric cardiac surgeon. I'm sure they'll be very helpful. Um, so yeah, most of you. So this is just, uh, okay. this is a little classification table that I've got. So trying to break it up into acyanotic and cyanotic. So obviously the key difference is the direction of the shunt. So left to right shunt, that means oxygenated blood is going towards the deoxygenated side. Um, so that causes the breathless baby, but cyanotic, as you guys have pointed out, so it's the blue baby. So that means there's mixing in blood. So deoxygenated blood is going into the oxygenated side and is then effectively being pumped into the circulation. Therefore, you get the cyanosis because you're having deoxygenated blood circulated. Um, so this is just a little classification, look over it in your own time, but we're going to probably look at VSD, PDA in a little bit of detail, 
um, compared to others, and then TOF and TGA probably need a little bit more um, detail as well. Okay. So left to right shunts, VSD is the most common left to right shunt. So there are different gradations of this. This is the most common thing that comes across. So it's often not detected at birth necessarily. So um, so there will be. So it depends on the size of the VSD. Obviously, the larger ones will be picked up earlier because there will be more of a failure to thrive. And essentially, if you can imagine the VSD is going from the left into the right, it just it causes the heart to expand and you get signs of heart failure. PDA will be picked up, obviously, sort of more neonatally usually because you have um, a continuous, it's often referred to as like a whirring machinery like murmur head just under the left clavicle. So that's failure of the ductus arteriosus to close and become the ligamentum arteriosum. So that's the patent ductus arteriosus or open ductus arteriosus. And then ASD, it depends on the size of it. I'm not going to go into ostium secundum and ostium primum, but that, that just depends on the site or like the exact point at which the ASD is. Ostium secundum is the more common of the ASDs, and that's about all you need to really know at this point. Um, and that's usually an ejection systolic murmur, whereas a VSD tends to be a pan systolic murmur. So you may have heard of Eisenmenger's phenomenal syndrome. So this is where it's like the reversal of a long-term left to right shunt. So, so essentially because of the irreversible increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance, the left to right shunt um, reverses and becomes right to left. Now that's where you get deoxygenated blood going into the left side of the heart and being pumped out to the systemic circulation. Now, if that happens, so if a VSD with Eisenmengers, if that becomes the case so that not only is blood going from the left ventricle into the right ventricle, but you're also having mixing of deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle going into the left ventricle, you, um, and that gets pumped out, that will present with cyanosis and breathlessness. So, whereas if it's just a VSD, you know, and it's like relatively big VSD, it will lead to things like um, you'll pick it up with recurrent chest infection, shortness, like ongoing shortness of breath and that kind of thing. Um, and so VSD and PDA, if you think about it, the, the holes basically, so between the right ventricle and left ventricle, and then the PDA is between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. So these are obviously areas of high pressure, whereas ASD is between the two atria, so that's relatively low pressure, which is why there is reversal of VSD or PDA early. Now, now this is a theoretical thing because with PDA, if it's, if, if that's often like dealt with within the first year of life, often like within the first month if the child is otherwise well. So if that's dealt with in the first year of life, it becomes less of a problem. As VSDs, you know, people live with it a lot of the time. And it's obviously part of other complexes, uh, other syndromes as well. So, um, so that's kind of um, an academic point about the PDA. But essentially, VSD deals with higher pressures because it's between the two ventricles as compared to the uh, atrial septal defect because it would be the foramen rather between, or, or the atrial septal defect, sorry, rather between the two um, atria. Uh, there is another thing called patent foramen ovale. So that is often depending on the size of the foramen ovale and how much is still patent, it can cause uh, problems into adulthood. So actually while I was on, um, while I've been on medicine, there was a youngish lady who came in with a stroke and it was basically a clot that went through a patent foramen ovale and then shot up to the brain and that's how she got the stroke. So was interesting but Peter Framan of Ali is obviously different to an ASD but it's in the same sort of anatomical location between the two atria. Okay so I'm sure this will be quite simple which of the following is not a cyanotic condition give me a second let me release the poll if you just bear with me. everyone's voted. Okay. 
Let's try and play three more. Five more people. Okay, I mean, eighty-two percent have voted. I think that's that's pretty good. So, um, yeah, well done to the seventy-one percent. So, VSD is indeed the only a uh, uh, only a cyanotic condition listed. Um, so we're. Uh, I'm just going to end. All right. So well done. Um, so as we said, so VSD is usually a left to right shunt. So it's not mixing of blood, but because there is a shunt, it leads to breathlessness and that kind of thing. You know. If it was VSD with Isenmengers, that would become a cyanotic condition because Isenmengers means reversal of a long-term left-to-right shunt, causing right-to-left shunting, which, which basically um, means that deoxygenated blood is going into the left ventricle and then being pumped. So, now, that would become a cyanotic, but this was just VSD without Isenmengers. Okay. Which of the following is not? So, Tetralogy of Fallow is obviously four things. So, I want you to... Let me just put this down for... Got about the same number of people as last time voting. Are you offering all three more people haven't voted? Okay, so I need a 32. Okay, fine. I think most people have voted, so well done to the people who said AST. That is indeed not a part of Tetralogy of Follow. Okay, so we're going to go on to looking at some of the cyanotic or right to. Oh gosh, sorry, give me one second. Just drop something. So we're just going to move on to some of the right to left chants. So to strategy follow is VSD, so ventricular septal defect, um, right ventricular hypertrophy, pulmonary stenosis, so that's pulmonary valve stenosis and um, overriding aorta. So essentially the pulmonary stenosis and aortic override leads to right ventricular hypertrophy and that can lead to a VSD. Um, okay, so this is often diagnosed in utero uh, with antenatal ultrasound. Um, or it's picked up in the neonatal period with murmur or the blue baby. So you'll hear usually an ejection systolic murmur, although with the VSD, you could argue mm, you could hear a pan systolic murmur. So the, uh, the ejection systolic murmur is usually referring to um, the pulmonary stenosis murmur. So that will be kind of second intercostal space um, left parasternally. Um, so the favourite radiological description of the heart in tetralogy of is a boot-shaped heart uh, and you have decreased pulmonary blood flow, so decreased pulmonary vascular markers. Okay, so I'm just going to have a look at it. So, so essentially what happens, so you can see that this is a normal heart and this is the tetralogy of fellow heart. So um, I don't know if you can see me using my cursor, but here goes. Um, so you can see here there's a VSD. So so this is the, uh, so it, it's kind of here basically, because this is where the purple is the mixing of the deoxygenated and oxygenated blood. So that's between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. And then basically what happens is that the, um, the pulmonary valve, so, so where's the pulmonary valve? It's here. So this is very narrow here. So pulmonary valve stenosis. And 
and then the aortic valve essentially so that's here so the aortic valve becomes enlarged it shifts to the right and it basically appears to um, open from both ventricles rather than from the left ventricle only so you can see that basically the aortic valve lies just over the um, VSD and so that's what's known as the over um, overriding aorta and so basically this mixed blood um, ends up going being pumped to the systemic circulation and also because of pulmonary stenosis um, you have back pressure and that leads to thickening of the right ventricular um, muscles and so the right as in the muscular wall and that known as right ventricular hypertrophy. Um, so this would usually be uh, clinically repaired by uh, pediatric cardiac surgeons. Um, there are a number of different things that they would have to fix. So they would patch the VSD and there are a number of other changes that they would make. But um, so this is usually done in the first year of life again. Um, and um, I'll leave the details of the surgery to the pediatric cardiac surgeons. Um, but essentially, it's something that is usually fixed pretty early on. It's not like left. VSDs on their own, however, as an acyanotic condition would be at the discretion of obviously the pediatricians or the uh, neonatologists looking after them. Uh, but usually, if, especially if they're small, they're often left until the child's a bit older. Um, and often if it's a mild VSD, they're asymptomatic, so they don't end up having surgery until a lot later if it becomes problematic. Okay. The transposition of great arteries, this is quite interesting. So I actually um, saw a baby who had this and um, I saw them after they had the operation as well. So it's a number of operations that happened. So essentially the pulmonary artery and the aorta, the two great arteries or vessels be, are switched. So instead of the right ventricle going into the pulmonary artery, the right ventricle goes to the aorta, which then pumps to the systemic circulation. And from the left ventricle, the other pulmonary artery, which goes to the lung. So you basically have these two unconnected circulations and you've only you, this is only like you know compatible with life if there is mixing of blood via an asd and also a pda so you've if you've got mixing at the level of the atria and you've got mixing at the level of the artery so, so between the pulmonary artery and um and aorta because because then at least some of the oxygenated blood is going but as soon as that pda starts closing which is why this usually presents you know day two to three once that pda starts closing and you know baby's very unwell very blue um so yeah they become cyanotic and breathless very quickly and uh but they have good pulses um okay so let's have a look here so normal heart on the left and uh, so you've got deoxygenated blood going to the lungs to be oxygenated coming in through the pulmonary artery here and then going and then oxygenated blood goes out to the body simple here you've got the right ventricle leading to the aorta and then here you've got the pulmonary artery bringing back oxygenated blood but then but then it's being pumped to the lungs so so it doesn't really make any sense so these are um parallel unconnected um unconnected circulations okay so avsd is a bit of both so it will um some people pointed out that this is also a um oh gosh i've lost my train of thought um avsd is also a sound condition it's, it is actually mixing of blood as well because it will be atrial and ventricular so um if it's a it's often associated with down syndrome uh it's the most common congenital cardiac defect associated with Downs. Um, you also get VSDs or ASDs separately, but AVSD is common with Downs, um, which is why as part of a Downs baby uh, follow-up, you would want them to see a cardiologist at regular intervals as well. Um, so I'm not going to dwell on this slide too much, but um, AVSD is usually picked up again. A lot of these congenital cardiac conditions will be picked up um, antenatally. Um, and then AVSD, it presents, you know, in the neonatal period. So neonate, as you will know, is classified up to 28 days or the first month of life, essentially, and then up to a year. So from the age of one month to 12 months as an infant. So it's usually still within the neonatal period that it gets picked up. And then again, there are surgical um, fixes for that. Pulmonary tricuspid atresia. So basically, it, it, so there quite well but then so the pulmonary or tricuspid valves are basically so on the right side 
they're they're very um, small or like they, they haven't grown basically, and so as a result, it blood doesn't flow, and therefore, if there's a right to left shunt, um, then then it can be then there's some oxygen oxygenated blood basically can, that can still get around to the um, to the rest of the body. I wouldn't worry too much about point. Triconspidus treaty is a is like a favourite cyanotic um, for heart disease to come up. But um, essentially, with these, if there's not mixing of blood, so if there's not a shunt already there, like uh, then you will have deoxygenated blood going, and therefore they will present unwell. Whereas if there is a shunt also there, then it becomes compatible with life for a bit longer. But they um, they become unwell relatively early on. So presentation of this is quite different depending on the degree of atresia. Um, so before I go on to outflow session, the other ones that we mentioned were things like hyperplastic left heart syndrome. I haven't gone into it in a lot of detail, but this is sort of, it's called the killer. So this is the congenital cardiac defect with the most mortality. Uh, so essentially it's where the left side of the heart is very, very underdeveloped. So it can affect the left ventricle, aorta, aortic valve, or um, the mitral valve. So basically the entire left side of the circulation. So basically the right ventricle is doing all the work. Um, so, um, so basically the, what happens when the ductus arterius is closed is that there's no, um, there's no more mixing of the blood and therefore you have very deoxygenated blood going. And the left ventricle is tiny, so it can't pump out much blood. And so it very quickly results in cyanosis and respiratory distress. And um, so, and the thing is with hyperplastic left heart, you quickly get weak pulses as well. In TGA, you don't tend to get weak pulses that early on. And um, hyperplastic left heart syndrome is uh, associated more in premature births and um, low, uh, with low birth weights as well. So, so that's just a little bit on that. Oh, I mentioned hyperplastic left heart syndrome. So they, they look the most unwell. So there are a number of different procedures. The two that come to mind are the Norwood and the Fontan procedures. I'm not going to go into detail because it's beyond the scope of this lecture, but it's something that's quite interesting to read about in your own time if you're so inclined. But um, it's fascinating how they do it because they basically enable a single ventricle in order to be able to pump. And um, at the Brompton, I was lucky enough to see a lady who'd been born with hyperplastic left heart syndrome and she had a Fontan procedure, so it basically only had one ventricle. So her echo was like very interesting to see. Uh, but um, that's a complex procedure that I will leave in the hands again of the pediatric cardiac surgeons. Co-optation of the aorta, basically this, um, you, you will have come across it in um, adult things as well, such as um, Marfan's can be associated with aortic regurgitation and co-optation of the aorta as well. Um, so, with co-optation of the aorta, part of the aorta is now, so unlike sort of aortic stenosis, which is obviously referring to the aortic valve, this is talking about the actual great artery, the aorta itself. So a part of it is narrow. So it depends on how um, narrow it is. So obviously the greater the degree of narrowing, the more severe the, um, the disparity in things like pulses and blood pressure and different limbs will be. And the point at which the narrowing is will also dictate um, at which point the pulses may be absent and so on. So it can become a critical congenital heart defect or sometimes with things like turners and things they can have co-arctation presenting much later because it might be a smaller area of narrowing which then gets narrowed over time and so it doesn't present in the sort of early life period. Uh, and it will usually, if it's severe enough, it will present after the duct is closed as an infant. Because again, there's no mixing of blood and therefore it becomes incompatible with life. And as you can see, radio, radio, radial or radio femoral delay is that. You can also have absent pulses. Okay, so things that we basically look for on cardiac examination of a child. So cardiac examination is obviously not just about the heart. It's about other things that you would look for as well. So on examination, what kind of things would we be looking for? A 
Sarah, Sarah, if you're good. And sorry, I'm just uh, reading an earlier comment where it says, um, why are asanotic breathless? It is indeed due to, um, it's usually due to a reduction in the cardiac output. So it, it basically ends up presenting the same way that heart failure does with cardiomegaly. So it's that kind of thing. So it's, it's, it's sort of both. And then pulmonary hypertension happens later, but it's not primary pulmonary hypertension, it's secondary pulmonary hypertension. Attention. Great to thrive, tachycardia, sinus is really good. Yeah, good. So we'll just, in the interest of time, just move on. So central sinusitis is like with the congenital sinusitis conditions like the lips, face, because then you have central areas of sinusitis. Uh, yeah. Um, so you want to assess the work of breathing. You want to look at the sats. Are they desaturated? You want to listen to the heart sound. You want to feel the pulses. Right ventricular heave, a sign of usually right ventricular hypertrophy. So that might be seen in things like strategy of fallow or isolated pulmonary stenosis. And of course, peripheral edema, because you might see that in, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just some of the things to look out for. Um, peripheral edema. So uh, in the same way you'll see in heart failure, you'll see peripheral edema. So like the fluid building up, it's the same thing. So you might have heard of the successes of innocent murmurs. So uh, my friend at Imperial, actually she has an innocent murmur, but um, basically sounds like an ejection systolic murmur. So S1, S2 plus, uh, so you'd write heart sounds one and two plus ESM or ejection systolic. So it, it's quite soft. They're usually asymptomatic and basically you hear it on auscultation when the position varies. There's nothing really to do about it. You don't need to interfere. Um, but a lot of people live with these innocent moments, basically. So, which I think I may have already mentioned this, but uh, which one of the following syndromes is associated with co artificial meat yield? So, let me just put this off the table. Yep. In the meantime, while you guys are talking about this, um, one of the last questions mentioned total ominous pulmonary venous return. So, um, I just wanted to do quickly touch on that. So it is actually a sinusic heart defect because essentially what happens is that the oxygenated blood from the lungs returns instead of to the left side of the heart, it returns to the right side of the heart. And here, so the oxygen, so the oxygenated blood basically mixes with the deoxygenated blood and therefore less oxygenated blood is pumped to the rest of the body. Um, so um, basically in order to survive total illness, pulmonary venous return, they would need to have an atrial septal defect that allows mixed blood to get to the left side of the heart in order to be pumped to the systemic circulation. So total ominous pulmonary venous return is a uh, cyanotic heart condition. Because I think I asked which one of the following is not a cyanotic heart disease um, and total anomalous pulmonary venous return was one of them. So, okay. Yeah, any more for anyone? Give me a few more seconds. Okay. So yeah, majority put Turner syndrome, which is correct. So well done. Um, so this is just um, a table basically. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of a chance to look at it. So as you will know, some of the uh, maternal infections or conditions can cause cardiac abnormalities. If you bear with me a second, I've got a question on the chart. Um, you're gonna get the you're gonna get the slides, but um, I'll just quickly pop. Oh, let's go back to the. Yeah, you can have a look at these. So soft systolic sounds one and two normal symptomless. So that's a bit sitting, standing, and special tests. So things like your chest X-ray and ECG are normal. Um, so special test just means investigations. Okay, um, I'm gonna go back. 
Um, okay. And can anyone think of any, so, so they're kind of syndromes in the sense that they're hard to say, oh, I just wanted to touch on SLE. So basically anti-Rho antibodies in particular can cross the placenta and um, go to the fetus and that causes complete heart block. So um, neonatal heart block with maternal SLE is something to uh, be aware of. Okay. Um, maternal drugs, warfarin, and then fetal alcohol syndrome is a big one to look out for. So fetal alcohol syndrome is, as you can imagine, more uh, common. Just bear with me. FAS is fetal alcohol syndrome. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Okay. So trisomy 21 is, as you know, down. So like I said, AVSD is the most common form of AVSD. Now, uh, Edward syndrome, which is trisomy 18, and Patel syndrome, which is 13, are complex. Um, so there are a number of different things that can cause. Um, cause that Turner syndrome, we've just talked about is coarctation of the eels. So Turner syndrome would be your classic. It would be a short female with, you know, they'll have long fourth um, finger and, and a heart defect with anomaly of pulses. They have Turner syndrome. And they'll also have like um, the problems related to um, um, amenorrhea as in like so they may have primary amenorrhea secondary um usually primary amenorrhea so that's the kind of thing turn to do d george which is a micro deletion on chromosome 22 um you'll know it as like you know so thymic problems so in terms of the so tetralogy of fallow is commonly associated with d george um or an aortic arch abnormality is the more common one uh okay can anyone i haven't put this as a question on the slides but there are a couple of associations or like syndromes which have heart defects as part of them. Does anyone, can anyone think of, there are two that I'm particularly thinking of. They're known as associations. If not, that's fine. We'll go on to it in a second. That's fine, right. So you may have heard of Chard or Vactel. So Vactil is um, usually associated with like trachea or bronco, um, so laryngomalacia or tracheomalacia. So these, so in order to be diagnosed with Vactil association, you tend to have about three of these, of which you can have um, cardiac defects. And the cardiac defects within Vactil are usually uh, VSDs, ASDs, or tetralogy of fellow, very similar for the charge association. So it would be um, most commonly is actually to try to follow followed by VSD and then um, AVSD and you can also have aortic arch abnormalities like you do in De George syndrome. Uh, okay, so there, but again, remember these are quite rare things. Okay, I think we're onto the saturation side. So I quite like this side because you, it kind of makes sense to me. So I wrote this table out when I was revising sort of. Um, when I was revising adult um, holes in the heart, basically. So normal, you can imagine, so you have deoxygenated blood. So if you ever do a VBG versus an ABG, so the way we can tell, is it a venous or an arterial sample is by, you know, how much um, the saturation or the SO2 on the gas is. So as you can imagine, you've got deoxygenated blood coming from the SVC, IVC, so from the big vein, from the great veins into the right atrium. So the right atrium saturation will be about 70% because it's deoxygenated. Um, I mean, this is a rough figure. It could be 60. It's still, that's still fine. So you have 70 and then going into the right ventricle, 70 going up into the pulmonary artery, 70. But then at the, at the once it comes into the left atrium, it's crossed through the lungs. So it's become oxygenated, so it becomes 100. So the normal heart should make sense quite easily. So you've got deoxygenated, 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 goes through the lungs, oxygenated, oxygenated, and then oxygenated to the rest of the body through the aorta. Now in an ASD, remember the hole is between the right atrium and the left atrium, and therefore there is mixing at the level of the right atrium and left atrium. So um, you get some of the oxygenated blood from the left atrium coming into the right atrium, which is why the right atrium has a higher amount of oxygenated blood and therefore it's about 85. Now obviously if it's 85 in the right atrium that will go into the right ventricle as 85, go into the pulmonary artery as 85 and then it gets oxygenated. 
Usually it will go from the left atrium into the right atrium because left atrium is a higher pressure, so blood will flow from that pressure, uh, area of higher pressure into lower pressure. Okay, that's ASD. VSD, the hole is between the right ventricle and the left ventricle, so left, uh, the right atrium will be 70% like in a normal heart. But then you will have some of the blood from the left ventricle, which is oxygenated, coming into the right ventricle. Therefore, your right ventricle goes up slightly in terms of the oxygenation because it's some mixing of the, it's not mixing, but some of the oxygenated blood is coming into the right ventricle. So it becomes this intermediate oxygenation. So you go 70, 85, and then 85 gets pumped out through the pulmonary artery. And then you get, obviously, oxygenated all on the other side. Patent ductus arteriosus, it is from the aorta into the pulmonary artery. Again, aorta higher pressure than pulmonary artery. So the mixing is there. So you've got 70, 70 on the right side. And the pulmonary artery, because you've got some coming from the aorta, it gets to the intermediate level of oxygenation. And then you've got 100, 100, 100. Now, VSD with Eisenmengers, remember, Eisenmengers is the reversal of the long-term left to right, shunt into the right to left. So now, actually, so VSD with Eisenmengers, so it's between the two ventricles. So you'll see that the right ventricle um, is like normal, but you'll see that the left ventricle, as compared to normal, is reduced because actually there's some mixing. So some of the deoxygenated blood is coming into the left ventricle from the right, and therefore that is no longer 100. So although the left atrium is 100 in the left ventricle, because of this reversed VSD with right to left shunting, you have 85% um, in the right ventricle, and, uh, sorry, in the left ventricle. And as a result, it gets pumped as 85% into the aorta. So this is when, this is why VSD with Eisenmengers will present with a cyanotic and breathless baby, uh, not baby, cyanotic and breathless, probably child. So PDA with Eisenmengers, so it's the same thing, but it will just be a difference between the pulmonary artery and aorta instead of between the ventricles. And then ASD is between the two atria. But because at the level of the left atrium itself, you have, um, you have an intermediate oxygenation, that's the level that will then be circulated to the rest of the system in circulation. Why have I bothered to go on about this? It was this question, so I'm going to give you a little bit of time to read through this. It's a difficult question, but this is the most difficult one of all of them. So Tommy is a seven-year-old child brought into A&E because of ongoing shortness of breath. So he's had several chest infections growing up, and he's smaller than his peers. So you can check that in the red book and things. So he's often suffered from shortness of breath particularly in exertion, he was just given a salby small inhaler, which hasn't really been that helpful. It really for a bit, but it doesn't really do much. So he's got a displaced, a displaced apex beat in the loud pansystolic murmur, but he's not blue. So which of the following is the most likely right heart catheterization study? So basically what you have to realize is what is the, um, what is the diagnosis? And then which one is consistent with it? I will talk through it. Uh, so let me launch the poll link. Okay. This one will take most time. The other two, I promise, are easier. Okay. So just over half of you have voted. The 
This is a really hard question, so don't worry if you're struggling. We'll talk through it. I promise the other two questions that are left. Wait about another 30 seconds, in case the nine people who haven't voted want to vote. Okay, just gonna end polling. And so, like three quarters of you have voted anyway. So, so nine of you. So, most of you put um, choice A, followed by so the popular choices. So, when A, D, C, B, and then no one put E. Okay, so let's have a look. Here's A. So, did did everyone? get that I was trying to get at a VSD. So I hope that was kind of clear. So they're relatively young, they've got a loud pansystolic murmur. Uh, so pansystolic is what tips it and the position tips it slightly in the favour of, uh, it might even be a bit lower. So like the fifth intercostal space parasternally or a bit more, um, a bit more to the left. Um, of the, of the parasternum, it, it's more indicative of VSD and ASD tends to be more of an ejection systolic. So that's a fine point. So if you just go through the cardiac catheterization, so, so the majority of you, so about 40% of you still did put A. So if it's a VSD, so they're not blue, so, so there's no right to left shunt, so it's only left to right shunt. So if it's a VSD, which is what A indicates, you've got, it, it's a left to right shunt between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. And therefore, so B is actually the normal oxygenations in a normal heart. So you have all the deoxygenation on the right side of the heart and then all the oxygenation on the left side, simple. So if you compare to B, so the only differences are the right ventricle and pulmonary artery. So that is because from the left ventricle, you are having some blood go into the right ventricle and therefore you have this intermediate oxygenation. And because the right ventricle then has 85% the pulmonary artery will then have the same amount that the right ventricle is pumping into it. Um, why is the left ventricle not affected? Because there is no mixing of blood, so there is no right to left shunt. Now, if you compare it to D, so you will see that the right ventricle is 70 and the left ventricle is 85. Now, that is VSD with Eisenmengers because there is reversal of the shunt as well. So not only on the right ventricle side do you have some mixing, but because some of the deoxygenated blood is also going to the left ventricle, you have 85. So a lower than normal um, saturation on um, for the left ventricle and therefore lower than normal for the um, aorta. Okay, and then so for the C is an ASD. So if any of you put C, that would be ASD. D is a VSD, but it's with ice and mangas. My clue was not blue. So that was where I was trying to lead you away from it. And E is a PDA because only the PA, the pulmonary artery, has an intermediate oxygenation. That's because you've got a hole between the aorta and the pulmonary artery leading to some mixing. Aorta is higher pressure, so the blood is going from the aorta into the pulmonary artery. That is a really difficult question. You will not get anything, but this is like the ultimate application is that if you currently identify VSD with no reversal of shunt, then A does make sense. For those of you who put D, which was the next most popular answer, that is a VSD with Eisenmengers. B is the normal one. C is um, ASD. Yep. And then E is PDA. Okay. I promise this is easier. So Michelle is a two-day-old neonate. So she's born at term. Uh, no complications, basically. She passed the newborn check a day ago, but is noted by her terrified mother to be going blue. It was very unwell. Sons of central cyanosis and no murmurs. What is the most likely diagnosis? So let me launch this. So this is the penultimate question. So we're very nearly done. You can get back to enjoying your Friday evening. Thanks for joining again. Just 
wave is moving to the right. Okay, I think most people have voted. So the most popular one was transposition of great arteries, which is correct. So let's just talk through them. So um, I think let me just have a look at what the polls show. So I think so. Nineteen of you put transposition of great arteries. No one put pulmonary stenosis. Then there's tragedy of fellow VSD and PDA. So. Basically, this was mainly in between, between TGA and TOF. The reason it's more TGA than TOF is because TOF will usually have some sort of murmur, usually an ejection systolic because of the pulmonary stenosis. So I was going for the no murmurs, um, and they will usually, I could have put normal pulses, that would have also helped, uh, because if I put hypoplastic left heart syndrome as one, that would get confusing because they would look similar, they would present similarly. Um, after duct closure. So the reason I've put two day old neonate is because that's around the time that the ductus arteriosus is closing to become the ligamentum arteriosum. And so um, the, and as a result, that's when this presents it. Because remember with TGA, while there are some, there is some mixing of blood, life is possible. Once that PDA closes, you've got no mixing of blood and therefore you have two completely unconnected circulations so what you need to do is basically you need to keep the um pda open so they usually give prostaglandins and things to do that so um so you need to keep the pda open in order to allow mixing until they can be taken to surgery and then they, it's a it's like the double snip and then like a flip over so that's a complicated surgery where they basically switch the circulations so it's like a two or three stage operation so they can't do all of it at once but the first key part is recognizing it could be TGA, getting a pediatric cardiac surgeon on board and trying to keep the PDA open with some sort of prostaglandin. And obviously a senior will be involved from pediatrics or neonate side. Tough, I think the main thing that it wouldn't be tough is they would usually have a murmur. VSD, yes, it could be VSD, but I would have put VSD with eyes and mangas if they were going blue. And it's very unlikely that uh, that would present as a two-day neonate. Patent ductus arteriosus would usually present with a machinery-like murmur and they wouldn't usually go cyanotic. Does that make sense as to why, I hope that sort of makes sense as to why the most likely is TGA. There's mainly between TGA and TOF. The reason it's TGA over TOF is because there are no murmurs. Okay, last question. Shen is a four-day-old neonate, so she is premature and was delivered early because of maternal eclampsia and is being managed on the NICU. So on routine examination, she's found to have a loud continuous murmur just under the clavicle and found to be slightly tachycardic. So obviously try and identify what the condition is in your head and then which one of the following is a treatment. So let me just release this last SDA for poll. Yeah. Just let people vote. Nearly done.
I just wait about 15 more seconds? Okay, so three quarters of these have voted. Well done. All right. So, in the interest of time, I'm just going to stop it there. So, well done to the people who put Indomethacin. in. So, essentially, this... Uh, so, I was trying to get you to identify it was a patent ductus arteriosus, hence a loud, continuous murmur. So that's what it sounds like, because it's just continuously open. So, under the left clavicle, should have put maybe left, that might have helped. So, um, they tend to be slightly tachycardic. Uh, so, but bear in mind, for a neonate, you know, Tachycardia. So their um, resting heart rate is well into the mid 100s. So um, 140 is often okay for a neonate. So just bear that in mind. But slightly tachycardic, loud murmur. Um, she's okay. So it's um, so there are certain things that PD is associated with. One of which is premature birth. So indomethacin is basically um, a type of NSAID. So you want to give an NSAID in order to close the PDA. Prostaglandin will do the opposite. So we were trying to give it to the baby with TGA because we were trying to keep the PDA open. So the PDA keeps it patent. Prostaglandin patent. Uh, try and remember it that way. Um, whereas indomethacin is the opposite. So they literally do the opposite things. Um, a Fontan procedure is for hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So it's for like simple ventricle circulation. Uh, diuretics is obviously treatment uh, part of the treatment for heart failure. So that was looking more at things that <coughs> excuse me, um, things like VSDs and steroids. To my knowledge, isn't the mainstay of any treatment for any congenital cardiac condition. So, so cyanotic versus asynotic. Basically, cyanotic is right to left because deoxygenated mixes into the oxygenated side and then gets pumped to the systemic circulation, and that's bad. Asynotic is left to right. Remember, Eisenmenger's is the reversal of a chronic left to right shunt due to irreversible increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. And therefore, the left to right shunt becomes right to left. So you can have something like VSD with Eisenmenger's. And it happens in a VSD earlier than an ASD because, um, um, because of um, VSDs are at higher pressures than ASDs. Several chromosomal and maternal infections lead to cardiac disease. So chromosomal abnormalities wise, we've got Down syndrome, so trisomy 21, Edward syndrome, trisomy 18, um, Sal syndrome, trisomy 13. Um, and then infections wise, we've got things like rubella specifically. Um, and then other conditions such as SLE, because anti rho antibodies and anti lar can cross if the, the placenta go to the fetus and cause complete heart block. Um, and then the changes that happen in circulation at birth. So remember, you've got the ductus venosus, foramen ovale, uh, and the um, ductus arteriosus. They all close, so the uh, foramen ovale closes to be, um, and then it leaves a little groove called the fossa ovalis. The patient ductus arteriosus closes to become the landmark ligamentum arteriosum. Um, you can have patent foramen ovale, you can have ASD, VSD. So there are many holes in the heart and many sort of narrowing of hearts. Uh, narrowing of heart valves and things that can lead to then just think of the back pressure and that will explain the pulmonary stenosis so that's between the um right ventricle into the pulmonary artery and therefore if that valve is narrow your right ventricle gets bigger and that's what happens in um tetralogy of flow okay um i hope that this has been useful i've not like i said i've not been through absolutely everything i've tried to go over some of the key facts so hopefully you have found that helpful please 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 fill in some feedback so that i can improve on it for next time when i give it to another batch um i hope it's been i've kept it pretty simple i've not gone into complex details i know especially at imperial um where, which is obviously where i went um it can they can really drag you into very complex norwood fontan and all these procedures um i've just cut that out because i don't think you need that if you're interested in pediatric cardiac surgery, which is fascinating, really. Um, please go away and read about it. And I hope that um, I'm glad that some of the that the cases were well received, and you can go through them in your own time. I think the slides will go up shortly on the um, uh, the slides will go up shortly on the becoming a doctor website. And thank you to becoming a doctor. This is my third one that I've done with them. It's been an absolute pleasure, and you guys have like always given up. Um, 
that you guys have always been out like your Friday evenings with me and it's been a real pleasure to teach you. So all the best and I hope this has been okay. Um, if you guys are ever th thinking of coming towards um, Leicester, Northampton, Rutland deaneries or West Midlands deaneries, um, let me know because obviously I've been through the LNR. So um, my email, which I should have probably put, is davishini. I'll put it in the chat so that everyone can see it. If you've got any burning, just general questions, um, let me. Um, so. Sorry if I seemed a bit distant at some point. I've just had like a family chat going as well because one of my family members is ill. So I was just keeping tabs on that as well. So sorry for sounding a little bit um, off at some points, but they're, they're okay, don't mind. They're okay, but I, I was just keeping tabs on it. Um, so I hope, uh, so if you've got any questions, feel free to email me and um, like if it's about general F1 stuff, because I did an IV fluids lecture last week and stuff and um, so if you've got questions, I am happy to try and answer them to the best of my ability. But thank you very much to becoming a doctor. I'll hand it back over to Bridget. Right, guys. Thank you.